Hello friends, in today's video I'm going to recap this Apple IIe card and then test it alongside the coveted Y cable inside my Color Classic Mystic. To begin, full disclosure, I have zero experience with the Apple II series. Now, I know that may come as a surprise to some of you, but when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, my parents put me in schools that didn't have Apple IIs. Uh, in my high school years, our computer lab was filled with Commodore 128s. Now, I was 13 in 1984 when my father brought home our first home computer, which was a Macintosh 128K with ImageWriter 1 dot matrix printer. And uh, through the years, I used MS-DOS computers and Windows 2, but I just never had the chance or the desire uh, to touch Apple IIs, at least not until now. Uh, so suffice it to say, there's a lot I still have left to learn uh, about the Apple IIs, and I think it's important to learn that. Uh, just because if we think about the history of Apple, uh, the Apple II series computers carried Apple through financially uh, in the 1980s. And it wasn't until November of 1993 that the Apple IIe was finally discontinued after an astonishing 11 years of continuous sales with the machine being largely unchanged through that time. I bought this Apple IIe card to become more familiar with the Apple II series. And what I really love about it is it's such a small and compact gizmo, I can easily hide away inside one of my vintage Macs, specifically the Color Classic Mystic, which uses the LC575 motherboard. But it's compatible with the entire LC series, uh, the LC475, LC1, 2, and 3, and of course all of the Performa equivalents of those machines. And it is also uh, compatible with the stock Color Classic with the 030 processor and the faster Color Classic 2. Now I purchased this from a gentleman by the name of Mike Morgano, who is in the Vintage Apple Macintosh Enthusiast Facebook group. And uh, his photo is a little bit grainy, but you can still see that uh, it had a lot of spilled capacitor fluid around both of the capacitors. Uh, Mike used 100% alcohol to uh, clean that up for me before he shipped it off. And uh, when I received it, it was very clean, but I still noticed some residue between the pins, so I gave it a one-hour bath in 100% IPA, and I used my toothbrush to scrub it clean. So it's all ready for the recapping now. I don't know if it works because I haven't tested it yet. I want to test it after the recap is done. And here is my soldering setup. I'm going to use my Hakko hot tweezers to remove the two electrolytic capacitors. But if you have a hot air station, that would work too. I just happen to have this. Uh, you could even do the job with two cheap soldering irons so long as you put both on either side of the capacitor. There's only two, so you really don't need any specialized or expensive equipment to do this. Uh, just any old solder will do. Uh, I'm going to use my regular soldering iron first, set to 350 degrees Celsius, because I need to add some solder to both sides of the capacitor to the pads because the fluid has eaten away at the stock solder. So by adding solder before I use my tweezers, that will make them easier to desolder. And then once removed, then I can solder on my Panasonic Oscon low ESR 22 microfarad surface mount capacitors. And I'll put these in the text description for you below. The negative side is a little bit hard to see, so I'll put a little ink on here to make it easier. It's the right side of the capacitor, the one facing towards this connector for both of the capacitors. So we'll just add some solder. He actually doesn't want to stick, I'll add some flux. Okay, here we go. Should have put solder on him first. And that will help. He is on there. Hmm. He is really stuck on there. I don't want to 
yank off the pad, so I'm being very careful. He doesn't want to come off there. Finally. Well, I've changed my mind about the other capacitor and I'm going to use my heat gun because the other one was hard to get out and this connector height would just about touch uh, my tweezers and I don't have any capped on tape and I'd probably need to jiggle it around a bit so I don't want to melt this connector so I'm using this piece of bent metal to act as a heat shield so the heat gun will spray in here and heat only this area and we'll see how that goes. Okay, hot air station set to 400 degrees. And let's see if I can pull him out this way. Well, that was easy. And here's a close-up of the pads. So what I'll do to clean them up is put a little solder on them. And then use my copper wick to carefully clean them. Put a little bit more. These two pads cleaned up nicely and are in surprisingly good shape considering the fluid that leaked from them. This via looks a little bit suspect, but if I put my probe on it in continuity check mode, this is the minus side, so it's ground. I got a beep. So uh, this the via is going to uh, ground and it's okay there and then this one here it has a via which I don't know where it's going because it just I see the little solder part on the other side of the board but uh, I confirmed that off camera that touching here and then touching the other side of the board also gives me continuity so uh, it looks like if I just clean off the flux I can just solder in my new capacitor just fine here now these are the pads of the other capacitor by the crystal, so I'm going to do the same copper wick cleaning treatment. Just do some cleaning with the 100% IPA here. Not too much flux on there. And uh, these pads came out surprisingly good too. Again, there was quite a lot of flux, uh, not flux, but um, spilled capacitor fluid that was on here. So we know this one is the negative side of the capacitor that means it needs to be a ground and I have my other probe yeah it's it's connected to ground and then this one I'm not sure where it goes but you don't want a capacitor too far away from where it's supposed to be connected to so I'm sure it's one of these pins in this area here but if it's disconnected it's going to be a problem let's see put my red probe on here and start no oh no no Oh, yes. It's making connection. Good connection there. Not showing any high ohmage. Yeah, so it's this pin right here that it's connected to. And the trace looks good. After a thorough cleaning with some 100% ISO alcohol, I can see that there's a little bit of exposed copper here. Just a super tiny bit here. And that's partly going to go under this capacitor. So I'm going to put some UV solder mask over this 
and this is the crystal here. So all of this uh, pad area, all of this trace area is connected to the pin that's just right here. So it's not um, creating any problem, even if this section, section was bad. But it's actually not, it's just that the green solder mask uh, was eaten away a little bit by, and you can even see over here, this has become darkened. This was starting to become eaten away too by the leaked capacitor fluid. And that's why if you leave capacitor fluid on there too long, it'll eventually do this on all of the traces. And then if you keep leaving it on, then it will eat through the traces. So it hadn't really started to eat through this trace, and this isn't just one trace, so it'll be okay. So I'm going to cover it up now. Okay, and here's my UV flashlight. So I'll keep it on there for a while. You can see a little piece of paper I put here. Um, I have actually scorched my LC575 motherboard before, so I always take cautions and care to make sure that I'm not going to affect any of the plastics. And it can get pretty hot if you leave it on too long. So I'm just going to leave it on the minimal amount of time required uh, to make sure the green stuff is hardened. Okay, so now it's time to do the soldering in. I'm just going to put some flux on our pads here to make sure everything is going to stick nicely. And I'm going to place our capacitor. The shape of the capacitor matches the outline, so if you forget which one is, you know, which way is ground, the ground is the purple marking here, of course, then the shape of the capacitor and that white line will help you. And we'll do the same for the other pads, put some flux on them. Okay, and after cleaning off some of the flux, I know ground is over here, and that's a good ground. And then this pad, I can just do a quick okay, he goes through to the back side, and then we'll get our ground over here again. Yeah, we got the ground, and then we know that this pin goes to, or the positive side of the capacitor goes to that pin. So, uh, we did it! <laughs> Yay! And if you're wondering if I measured the stock capacitors well, uh, this one is just too damaged to measure. It just doesn't measure anything. And this is the one that I pulled off more cleanly with my hot air station. But still, uh, it's very bad capacitor measured one kilo ohm <laughs> at only six microfarads. So, um, yeah, definitely bad capacitors. And as for my new capacitors, yes, I measured it 22 microfarad right on the button and uh, one ohm at 120 hertz. Um, and you'll get uh, lower ESR at higher frequencies. It's interesting to note that the Apple II e card is not an emulator, folks. If we take a look in the upper left corner, we see that it has a true 65CO2 CPU, C standing for CMOS. Earlier versions of the chip were just the 6502 based on NMOS technology. 
And the next chip over is the LSI Logic chip, which is also known as Gemini. It is basically a enhanced Apple IIe system on a chip, uh, with most of the chips of a true Apple IIe shrunk down, all except for the CPU, RAM, and floppy controller, down onto this one chip. Uh, next over from there, we have 256K of RAM. And uh, then in the upper right corner, we have the integrated WAS machine, which is a floppy disk controller chip. Uh, then, of course, on the far right, we have the connector, which goes to a Y cable connecting external floppy disk drives and also a, any joysticks that you'd like to connect. The only thing that's really being emulated here is just the video circuitry because it goes through the host Mac. Except for the slots and some of the ports, it's basically an enhanced Apple IIe shrunk down on this little tiny card. Pretty neat. Installation is fairly easy. Uh, you can see I started off with a grounding strap. This is grounding it to earth ground. And that makes sure that no static electricity is gonna accidentally zap your motherboard or your card. And I just took off the back panel from the Color Classic and removed the motherboard here. Now in your case, you may have a stock Color Classic motherboard. This is a Mystic, which means it's an LC575. I've also got some fancy stuff on here, the fan, the heat sink. K Koba's uh, Spicy O'Clock custom VRAM. You can see my Spicy O'Clock video for more information on that. I also have a battery replacement that uses three LR44 batteries. I originally had it mounted here with Velcro, uh, but the card is going to go here, so I had to move it over here. You just want to make sure that this area is clear uh, because we're going to put the card right here on this socket. I purchased my Apple II e card used, and so it did not include all of the parts. Most of them, but not all. And one of them it did not include was the spacer that is supposed to mount in this little hole here. Um, I have a spacer kit, so thankfully I was able to use one spacer and one screw to make a perfect length. And I decided to put it over here for reasons I'll explain in a few moments. You probably don't even need the spacer, but it's just nice to have because if you have a spacer somewhere in this area, and if you accidentally press down on the card here, then with the spacer, it's not going to put undue stress on your connector. Without the spacer, if you push down on this side of the card, it would. So that's the entire purpose of the spacer. Now, for the reason why I put it here on the edge of the card instead of in the middle is because the card will mount like this. And so if you use this hole here, the spacer will come down between these two chips and there are traces, circuit board traces here. And so if you were to push down on the spacer, it's, it's hard plastic. If you push down too much, it could potentially harm those traces. And so I decided to put it on the edge because over here, that will sit right on top of this chip. And there's no worry that it's going to cause any problems there. Now here is the connector which is broken into two parts there's the longer section of it and the shorter we're not going to connect anything to this shorter part and we're going to make sure that our card connector is lined up such that this y cable port is facing out this way where all the other ports are on the motherboard and you'll also notice that i have a soft cushion under it so that way when i push down it's not going to flex the motherboard in the middle and uh, it's very easy to attach that, you just put it on like so, and then with two fingers, just very gently push down. And you just want to make sure that your spacer is at a length such that it's not uh, sticking up, it's just perfect so that the card is going to be level once it's seated into the socket. And then, in order to put your back panel on, in this case, this is a 3D printed one because it's a Mystic motherboard. Uh, you'll need to break out the little slot here so that your card will fit through. And then with the back panel secured, it's just a matter of connecting your Y cable, if you have one, or the equivalent uh, to your connector over here. And these are expensive and hard to come by. Um, just so happened that the one I bought, you know, it came with the card, but uh, there are some people who have made equivalent uh, versions out there. So I will put that in the text description for you, for those of you who have the card, but not the cable. And once that cable is installed, 
we can then connect a joystick to the smaller cable and then connect uh, a fl single floppy drive, Unidisc or a gray five and a quarter or floppy EMU uh, to the floppy connector. Now it's time to install the software required to use the 2E card. If you have the original discs that came with your 2E card, and if the version on those discs is compatible with your vintage Mac and Mac OS, then that's probably the fastest way for you to install it. In my case, because I have an LC575 Mystic motherboard, the software that was given to me on these two discs is unfortunately not compatible. Uh, so what I had to do is head on over to the Macintosh Garden. And from the 2E card page, I snagged downloads 5 and 6. Uh, download 5, described below, is the version 221 installation software. And 6 is version 222D1, which is required for the LC and Performa 575 computers. Uh, by the way, up in the download section, you'll notice that there's a brochure PDF and also the manual PDF here. Uh, these are versions that I painstakingly fixed and uploaded here to the garden. So if you find these elsewhere and find it has graphics or uh, up, uh, font problems, then you'll probably want to come back here and grab these. Uh, so I downloaded uh, these two files to my modern Mac. And then I used the Basilisk 2 emulator to copy the files from Macintosh Garden over and I double clicked the SEA to decompress it to make it uh, easier. It's faster here on the emulator. I then connected my Mac SD to the back SCSI port using Steven Arsenal's OverEasy 2, put in the SD card here and start up. Here we are booted to the desktop. By the way, folks, I have this deliberately defocused. It's hard to shoot CRT screens with a 4K camera and avoid all of the color fringing and the more. So that's why I defocused a little bit and didn't apply sharpening just because it looks actually better this way. Now I have my Macintosh Garden 221 image, double click to mount that. Uh, it should be the same for you if you've got disk copy six on your computer. And I was sure to put the 222D1 app inside a folder because if you don't put it inside this folder and you just leave it at the root level of your drive, then uh, the installer will try to override it. So let's go ahead and do the installation here. And then it will ask you which drive you want. System 7.1 is Mac SD. I want to install it on that. And there we go. So it installed the system extension. And so it's important that we restart. But before you restart, you have to make sure you go into the memory control panel and switch off 32-bit addressing. In my case, it's already switched off, but uh, the 2E card is not compatible with 32-bit addressing. So you're going to need to make sure you do that. And then we'll restart. OK, and here we are. And now you can see some more icons because I actually put some ProDOS files on my Mac SD. You're not able to see these until you restart with the appropriate extension. So if I load up, I'm using system 7.1 here. If I look at my extensions folder, then it's going to have a file on here that if I display it by icon so you can see it better, uh, this one here, the ProDOS file system. And in this case, it is version 1.2.1. This is the newest version that comes with the 221 installation disk. And then of course we have the 2.2.2D1 version uh, inside this folder here. And what it installs is basic.system, a file here, ProDOS, and then of course it installs the main app, which is version 2.2.1. Uh, so it's basically now just a matter of going into the software. Uh, I'm Because I have a Mystic motherboard, I am going to use this app. And in order to do that, I can, they both are named the same. So I'm just going to create a folder, put the older version app in that, pull this one out of the folder here so I can use it. And then I'm going to double click it. But before I double click to start this, the manual tells me that 
If I hold down the Option key on the keyboard after you launch it, so double click, hold down the Option key, I'm holding it down now, and what that will do is automatically come into this uh, 2E Option panel. If you don't hold down the Option key, then it will go straight into the Apple II environment. But uh, I really don't like that. I like to, I always fiddle with the settings, and I'm sure you will too, so you just need to remember that. Whenever you launch the app, hold down the Option key, and then you'll come here before you go into the Apple IIe environment. Now, I'd like to talk about some of the features of this because this is really key to your experience. And uh, the first thing you're going to see is the general settings. You can go with normal speed, 1 megahertz, faster speed, 1.9 megahertz. So it's almost double the speed uh, if you increase that here. And then you can choose the Apple IIe beep or simple beep or whatever other kind of wild beep. You can change the beep if you want to, but we'll just keep it on 2E. Um, you can do inverse, color or monochrome, uh, key re delay, uh, type ahead. Currently it's off, but you can turn that on. It's a type ahead feature there. And uh, then additional option panel key. Uh, we're not going to set that up. The manual talks more about that. I'm not going to talk about every feature, but basically it's typically not something you need to worry about. Um, then in memory card, this is your expansion card, which it says goes into slot 7. It's currently set up for 256K. Then you've got your mouse card settings. You can adjust the speed. This is going to adjust the Apple II side speed, and the mouse card usually goes into slot 4. Then you've got printer card, serial card. I don't have a printer or a modem, so I'm not going to worry about those. Uh, then uh, it also has slots. And this is really what is the most important here. Slot 3 is not changed. And this is the only thing that's, that's really emulated. Well, technically all of your slots are emulated uh, because you don't have slots on the 2E card. But slot 3 is not changeable because that uses the Max video system. Uh, to drive the Apple II. And then these are all the defaults. So you have a printer in slot one. I don't have that. So, you know, I could leave it there, but I could also take it out. You also have a clock card. Sometimes this can cause problems. So the manual says you can remove it if you have trouble loading certain software. Ditto for the mouse. And by the way, if you want to switch slots, like say I can drag the mouse over here to slot two, and you see, see it's going to reverse both of them that way. Uh, or you can just drag it back. So. Uh, slot 5 typically is reserved for smart port, and that's what this icon is. Slot 6 are your 5 and a quarter inch drives. And then slot 7 uh, is your memory. And then down here is your startup. So it's going to scan uh, from slot 7 down to 1 if you set it to scan. Or you can set it to be slot 5 if you want to. So it'll ignore slot 6. And if you don't have any 5 and a quarter inch uh, drives or anything like that, then you could just pull it down here. So the spare cards section here is just your reservoir for unused cards. And then anything up here is uh, what, well, what you're actually going to use. And then down here we have smart port. Now these are various drives. I'm just going to pull these out of here for a second. So everything in the spare disk drive section, normally this would be blank if you didn't add anything, but because I added these to my Mac SD, uh, they are appearing down here. And then your Mac's internal floppy is going to appear up here, usually as drive one. And it looks like a Macintosh LC. <laughs> Even though you have a Color Classic, uh, it's going to look like this. And uh, well, I have an LC575 board, but nevertheless, the icon is going to be the same. So you could put a ProDOS disk into your Color Classic's internal drive and manipulate it from here. So, uh, there's down here, we also have an eject button. If you don't remember that the keyboard shortcut is, you can eject your internal floppy disk from here. And uh, then uh, we can actually go into the 2E mode. I'm going to put a boot disk here. I downloaded Dazzle Draw and put it on the um, uh, Mac SD. So now what we want to do is I'm going to, because I made some changes here, I want to restart the 2E, and this will take me into the 2E mode. And here we are. And it's loading it right up. 
And then of course you have your uh, setup the way that you want to use it. I'm going to use a mouse. Um, professional file just means it gives you more options. And uh, no, I'm not going to save these changes. And then press return. And it takes me right in. Now, one of the things I noticed about using the Apple II, because again, I'm very new to the Apple II, is all of the color fringing uh, that you see here. And it's really, I don't think it looks good, <laughs> but I think it's just the way that Apple designed the system for compatibility with uh, TVs, that it just happens to do this a lot of the time. However, if you want to eliminate this, we can get out of here by pressing uh, Command, Control, Escape, which will go back into the Mac environment. And then we can change from color to monochrome. And then click the Continue button. And then it, it, look, it eliminates the color fringing, but of course we lose our colors. So let's just load up an example photo here, a picture. Now, one of the things I did learn about the Apple II is we have to change directories, and how you do that is with prefix. So I clicked prefix, and I know that it's in the slideshow directory, so I'm going to click OK on that. And then now I'm going to choose the photo, and I know which one I want. It's called Monarch, and I'm going to OK that. And here is the Monarch. So it kind of looks like it's in shades of gray. Go up here to view picture and we can view it full screen, but it's gonna be more gorgeous in color, so I'm gonna click uh, on my keyboard, Command, Control, Escape, and switch it back to color, and click Continue, and there it is, in glorious color. It looks pretty neat. Okay, Command, Control, Escape, to go back to this environment now. Now here's another neat feature. If I go up here to the Edit menu in the Mac environment and choose Copy to eScreen, then I can go into the Mac environment and load up a graphics app, in which case I'm going to use Canvas 3.5.3 uh, because it doesn't use so much memory, and because 32-bit addressing is off, we don't have a whole lot of memory. So we can't run Photoshop 4, for example. So just load up Canvas here, and then we can paste the image that we just copied so you can see what it looks like. And there it is. So the full screen image that was in the Apple IIe mode uh, can be displayed in any graphics program, which is pretty neat. Uh, now I just want to say a little something about screen resolution. The Color Classics stock resolution is 512 horizontal by 384 pixels tall. And that's the same as the Apple Macintosh 12-inch RGB display. But uh, when you enter the 2E environment, like this, it switches the resolution to 560 pixels across and retains the same 384 pixels high. Now, that is on the stock color classic. But I have the VGA mod, and the VGA mod gives me 640 pixels by 480, 640 by 480. And this is why, if you look closely, you can see that the horizontal width of the content here, it doesn't extend as far out as the Macintosh environment does, right? Here's the Macintosh. So you see there's a little black border over here and a black border over here. So you would think that the 560 pixels is going to extend out to the very edge of each side, just like the Macintosh environment. But when you have the VGA mod, that's not true because actually this from here to here is 640 pixels. And as I said, the 2E environment is 560 pixels. So when you have the VGA mod, what it boils down to is this. The maximum width that you're going to get is 560 pixels within the 640 pixels. And that is why the, the very edge over here on the left doesn't extend quite over as far as the Macintosh environment does.
because the Mac environment is 640 pixels, and the same for the right side. So the content of your 2E is going to be smaller, very slightly, but still smaller on the display when you have the VGA mod as compared to when you have the stock resolution. Now I have heard that this card displays at 60 hertz, and that's fine because the VGA mod that I did is 60 hertz. But I don't know what's going to happen if you have the high resolution VGA mod, which uses, uh, I think it's 67 hertz frequency. I haven't tested that. Who knows? It may not even work at all. So if you have one of those mods and, and your 2E card works, please let me know down in the comments. Now yeah. to quit the 2E environment, there's nothing we have to do on the Apple II side. We just click the quit 2E button here. And it's just going to say if you didn't save any work on the Apple IIe side, that's going to be lost. Are you sure? And yes, that we want to quit it out of here. And I just want to show you something else. Uh, all of the disk images over here, I'm not going to go into detail on this video on how to use Mac SD, Blue SCSI, and Floppy EMU. I'm going to make a part two video that shows you all that. But just for now, I want to, you probably noticed that when you, when I loaded up the program, all of these disappear from the desktop. And I'm going to do it again, just so you can see that. Now note, watch them over here. They're all going to vanish, right? And that's normal. That's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a problem at all. Um, but what I'm now going to show you is that I have a floppy disk. I formatted this ProDOS 800K and it, uh, the Mac allows you to do that. I'll actually get out of here and show that to you. Quit to E, don't save changes. So I'm going to put this in the Color Classics internal floppy drive. And then it comes up here and it says it's ProDOS. Now if I wanted to erase that, I just go up to Erase Disk and it gives me the option to do that. You can erase it as ProDOS. And if I put a 1.44 megabyte floppy into the drive, then it would give me the option to format it at that capacity as well. So this is a ProDOS disk, and uh, just once again to repeat what I said before, this app that we've been using is 2.2.2 D1, which is for the LC575 board. If you don't have a Mystic, then you're going to be using an earlier version. But I did find an issue that pertains to the Mac's internal floppy drive. So I'm going to go back in here and hold down the Option key, which will take me directly into the Option panel here. And then I'm going to go down here to Smart Port because that is where your internal floppy drive is set up. So I put Copy2 Plus. This is something that I added on my Mac SD. And I put it in slot 1, which means I'm going to boot from it. And then I have my flo internal floppy drive icon here. If you don't have it there, for example, if you have the internal floppy drive down here, you won't be able to use it. So you have to have it up here so you can access it. You could put it in slot 2, drive 1, or drive 2, whatever you like, but it needs to be up here somewhere in order for you to use that within the Apple IIe environment. And so now I'm going to continue, and it's going to boot off of the Copy2. Now Copy2 is from Central Point Software. You, as Mac users, probably know it, uh, that it will, you know, on the Mac side, copy, copy protected software. So this gives you a lot of functions to deal with disks. And one of the issues that I found is that when I try to format a disk, in this case it's going to be ProDOS, I can't put uh, uh, DOS 3.3 format on an 800K disk, right? It has to be ProDOS. So when I do that, I need to tell it which slot and which drive. And if we go back and look real quick and go to Smart Port, it's going to show us that it's slot 5, drive 2. Okay, so if that's fine, slot 5. Drive 2 is the one I want to format. Hit return. Insert disk. I've already done that. Ready to format? Yes. Do I really want to dis destroy that disk? And that's the name, right? And yes, I do. And then it says, what's the new name? I'm just going to call it anything. TTT. And hit return. And it says, no disk in drive, which is wrong. There's actually a disk in drive. But this is one of the problems that I found. And it's ate up hours of my time and a lot of time interacting with people on Facebook and Tinker Different trying to figure out what in the world is going on here. Well, it seems that if I quit out of here, 
it's a problem with this version. This 222D1 version seems to be looking for the floppy drive of the actual LC575, which has a little black door type of floppy drive, and that's different than the floppy drive of this Color Classic. So, uh, it, it doesn't like it. However, however, here's the interesting thing. If I go to the older version, right? So I'm going to first put the newer version into its own folder, pull out the older version, which is, if we look at it, version 221, which I have heard is not compatible with the LC575, but in fact, it actually works. <laughs> on the LC575 board. And if I now go into F for format, P for ProDOS, we know it's slot five, drive two, yes. Destroy it, yes. What's the volume name? I'm gonna call it TTT and hit return. And now it found it and it's working. And it's formatting the disk right now. Why? Well, <laughs> for some reason this older version doesn't care that the floppy drive isn't the same as the LC575, probably because the older version doesn't understand what the LC575 is. So what I'm trying to say is that even though the newest version is technically for the LC575, because this is in a color classic, if you want to format disks that are in the internal drive, or if you want to write files to them, those are the two things that are impossible to do <laughs> Uh, with the LC575 Mystic Motherboard and version 2.2.2D1. The fix is that you're going to have to use 2.2.1 instead. And then it will allow you to format disks and write to them and so on. And it's finished formatting here. So I'm going to press return. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to quit the 2E environment. And then we're going to take a look here on the desktop and we see a disk name TTT, and there it is. So it did a successful format. Unfortunately, there's another monkey wrench that's being thrown into this, <laughs> and that is uh, I have this system overclocked using Kcobas Spicio Clock. Some of you have seen my video on that. And right now I'm running, well, I'll just show you. I have Clockometer. I am running this Mystics 68040 at 40.09 megahertz. At this clock speed, everything is okay. No problem for me to use this older version 2.2.1. However, if I boost Spicy O'Clock to overclock my CPU to 44 megahertz or higher, then this app, the older version, suddenly stops working. <laughs> Yeah, it's annoying, but the interesting thing is this newer version 2.2.2 D1 app continues to work. The only caveat is, like I said, you won't be able to format or write to disks that are inside the internal floppy of your Color Classic Mystic. But if you don't use that disk, then it's irrelevant. And you can, I've, I've used this 49 and 50 megahertz. At 50 megahertz, it got a little bit too hot and I was seeing screen artifacts on, on the display. So I cranked it down to 49 megahertz, but technically it will still work. Your 2E card will work fine, even with a full FPU version 68040 that is highly overclocked. And just to show you what happens if I overclock it to 44 megahertz, this again is the 2.2.1 app. When I double click it, it will say your Apple IIe card is defective, problem number four, but we know it's not defective. And then if I put this version away and it, it take out the newer version, 222 uh, D1, then see it's, it's loading without problem. So that again is showing you the clock speed contingency.
And that brings this part one video to a close. In part two, I want to talk more about how to use BlueSCSI, Mac SD, and the floppy EMU alongside the 2E card. Now the reason I didn't go into detail on all of these devices in this video is because I just didn't want to make it that long. And there's really a lot I have to say on that point. Uh, but the other reason is because it can be a little bit fiddly uh, to get Apple II images to work right uh, on the blue SCSI. However, there's a new Mac app out now called Disk Jockey, which promises to make that much easier. And I want to take a look at that. And uh, also, I want to say that the floppy EMU that I have is model B. The one I have on order now is model C. And the reason I ordered that is because I was speaking to Steve Chamberlain of Big Mess of Wires. And even though model B and model C both share the same Macintosh firmware and the same Apple II firmware files, Mo model C has a unique Apple II feature, which the model B doesn't have. And so that's why I bought it, and I want to see if it, uh, it has some kind of benefit for you. Uh, also, I have a flippy floppy <laughs> from K Koba on order, uh, Carol's Mac Mods. And that's a unique device that adds an external uh, floppy disk connector for the Color Classic Mystic, which uses an LC575 board, which has no external floppy drive connector. And so what that allows me to do is, I can connect the ribbon cable of a floppy EMU, Model B, Model C, whichever, and uh, I can have a, a toggle switch on the back, uh, which will allow me to switch off the internal uh, floppy drive of this Mac, and allow me to switch in the floppy EMU which is pretty neat. And uh, I have to use Macintosh firmware, not the Apple II firmware for that, but I want to see if that has a benefit. But even if it doesn't have a benefit for the Apple IIe card, I know it will have a benefit in general because uh, it's nice to use the floppy EMU on my SE30 and other Macs, and I really would like to have that convenience on this one. And Flippy Floppy promises to do that. So hopefully I can add that into my part two video. And uh, also, uh, well, I want to demonstrate uh, the CH Products Mach 3 joystick, and this is considered to be one of the best uh, joysticks for the Apple II series, even better than the Apple branded joystick, better than Kraft and all of the other brands that you may have heard of. And uh, Javier Rivera over at the Apple II group and on Facebook very kindly uh, sold this to me, and he tested it before he shipped it out. And I think that's so important. There's so many eBay sellers and other sellers of these who charge top dollar for them, but who don't fully uh, test them to ensure that it's going to work. So this is a nine pin uh, joystick that, uh, oh my goodness, it's in wonderful condition. And uh, I actually like this color scheme better than the newer platinum version. Uh, but this connects to the Y cable uh, of the Apple II e card and um, we're going to look at how that works with some games in part two. And then if I still have time, <laughs> I want to talk about uh, emulators like Virtual 2. I recently purchased a license. I think it cost me about $39. Yes, it's not free, but it's considered to be one of the best uh, Apple II emulators that emulates the Apple II, Apple IIc, Apple IIe, uh, everything except for the 2GS. And, um, so I've been playing with that, and I even spoke to the creator uh, about it. So, you know, I have so much content that I want to do. It may end up that I may not be able to fit it all into a part two. I may have to do a part three. I'm not sure I'll decide that when I'm making the video, but suffice it to say, folks, I have a lot more great content coming your way, so please be sure to stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for watching this video today, and I wish each and every one of you a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.